Brunswick has a great opportunity, and it comes in the form of hemp and cannabis. Today's guest is going to bring us into the deeper understanding of the impact that plant and the relationship we have with that plant can have on our province. He speaks to some interesting points. A key one is we need to start building a culture around how to be a team as a province to move an economy forward in a new direction. And all of that comes from understanding a single plant. So let's jump right in on what it is you do and right. why you're here to talk today. Well, yeah, so what we found at Canoevo, um, that's our company in Canoevo Biotech, we're a Frederick and company. Mm -hmm. We're focusing on drug pharmaceuticals, but we're focusing on it by using only compounds from cannabis. We have recognized that right now we have a cannabis uh, program, medical cannabis program, where doctors prescribe medical cannabis, which in the end is just a flower, it's just a plant. Yeah. Now, no doctor would prescribe you uh, three poppy flowers a day in a tea for your pain, <laughs> yet they prescribe opiate painkillers. And the, the opiates are, in the end, all derived from poppies. They're poppy flowers growing in fields, and then it gets extracted and turned into a pharmaceutical. We don't do this with cannabis. And the problem that comes with it is many doctors don't want to prescribe something that is a plant, in, West, in Western medicine specifically. And um, the question of the dose, on how it works, um, you know, does it work for a specific disease or is it for everything? All these kind of questions we're trying to solve by making formulations and coming up with, in the end, either a pill or a cream or some other quote-unquote pharmaceutical that can be prescribed by doctors. And yours is different somehow? Well, I was, first of all, we're one of the only people that are focusing on this um, step. Most people are still looking at cannabis and they want either the flower and then they maybe go as far as saying, oh, we grind the flower up and we put it in capsules and have always the same weight. Mm -hmm. uh, that still doesn't standardize it. Okay. That's still, um, you know, the flower is, it's a biological individual kind of it's it, it grows and every time it grows it grows a little bit differently yeah. even if you're cloning the flowers we've seen this with dolly the sheep you can clone and clone but the aging process still keeps going so in the end after six seven generations you're not going to have exactly the same as you had before mm -hmm. and for for a medical treatment in a, in a scientific and, and medical sense just we can't do that and this is not how our medical treatments work but yet somehow everybody seems to think that when it comes to Canada uh, to, to, to cannabis, it's this is the way we're going to go. Mm -hmm. And I just say no. I mean, I I understand that there is a drive right now in the province specifically. It's big in the in the news everywhere about a recreational side of cannabis. Mm -hmm. Where here I say, okay, you can use the flowers for this part, uh, you know. But when it comes to a, a medical application, I think it's absolutely irresponsible to keep the onus on the patient to figure out his dose, to figure out which strain of marijuana is going to work. Um, all those things, they have to get solved for a patient. Yeah. Can, how did you get started with this? Like, where does this it, because I can hear between the lines a thousand questions want to yeah. pop up. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's topical, mm -hmm. um, especially in Canada in 2017, 2018. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there or mm -hmm. misperception out yeah. there. And then you come along with this new company thinking, yeah, but there's a specific application right. that it can meet. Yeah. So how does that all so start? It, well, it started, uh, actually it started all because I missed a flight. <laughs> uh, as things in life often do. Um, I was working, before this, I was, I was a consultant for quality assurance, uh, good manufacturing practices, which is a standard in the pharmaceutical industry on production of pharmaceuticals. I worked a lot in the cannabis industry at the time for when it all started to come up with the licensed producers and, and the questions coming, well, how do we do the quality assurance? I was helping there. And uh, I was in Toronto and I missed the flight on the way back. I met a gentleman who also had a cannabis research company in South America. Hmm. Uh, he got me down there and that's where I met Daniel Carbo, who's my co-founder now for this company. Um, now the company in, in South America didn't do very well, so we, we both ended up not working there anymore and uh, decided this is 
too good of a thing that the idea we had was we always realized cannabis for medical purposes has to be standardized because it's uh, we don't accept any other medicine that isn't standardized so why should we do it any way different than cannabis hmm. um, but we also with, with my colleague Daniel who is a it's a nanosystems engineer uh, what does that mean he makes very very small particle sizes so he can do a micro encapsulation you've heard about it for vitamins to get your 24-hour release um, that uh, you know he's, he's worked on this for drug delivery for uh, chemotherapy he also is what is a big field now a, a bioinformatics specialist that means um, he can program computer computers to predict how specific drugs interact in the body and he's been working specifically on what's called the endocannabinoid system, which is our intrinsic system we have in our body that responds to cannabinoids. Cannabinoids from the plant cannabis, but also we actually, as humans, we produce specific cannabinoids. So, um, and from that sprang the idea of, of going to make sophisticated medicine out of cannabis. And uh, in April, Somebody, uh, I always say somebody was foolish enough to give us some money, which was um, <laughs> SOSV, Rebel Bio Accelerator, a fantastic accelerator program for anybody who has a, a, so a biotech or Synbio, as it's called, startup, um, and who wants to do a, you know, accelerate the company forward, Rebel Bio is, was a great program for us. Um, they give they give us an initial investment, a small amount of cash, and, and the accelerator program, we were in Ireland for four months. And uh, the idea became to proof of concept, to a patent that we have now, uh, to a first <coughs> to a first formulation, and now we have uh, clinical trial partnerships with international partners in Holland and Ireland, so and then here in Canada, and uh, that's only been six months. And I don't think without the accelerator program, six months and two people. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah. So uh, we've we've gone pretty well, I think, but we have to move fast because this whole industry is developing <coughs> fast. And we want the industry in New Brunswick to develop as strong and as and as well as, as it can be done. Because, of course, I, I'm looking out for my own company, but I, I really think that our company is going to do much better if we have a, a, an ecosystem here that supports it. <coughs> um, and with this ecosystem, we're looking at not only medicinal cannabis, that will be the recreational part. Um, this is not what we do, so it's something on the outside. But also, there's going to be an industrial side of industrial hemp applications. So, we're looking at, at, at three pillars of, of hemp. And uh, I've always said to people, can you name me a plant that has more applications than cannabis? I'd love to hear it because I'm probably going to start working on it. Mm -hmm. um, having the medicinal uh, 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 part here, the medicinal part, and then a recreational side and an industrial side. Those three have to be together. And hopefully in New Brunswick, we can have all three very, very soon. Media tend to only cover the recreational side. So yeah, you have got a bit of an uphill climb then, trying to get people to catch on because you're trying to develop a culture. Yeah. Not just a product. Yeah, exactly. Um, the recreational side is far more sexy than the medicinal <laughs> side would be, I think. it's uh, It's got a lot more of this... Uh, to, the whole taboo about cannabis came from the recreational illicit use of the drug, right? Yeah. So now this is becoming more socially accepted, it's, it's becoming legalized. So now, of course, everybody is looking at this tantalizing recreational illicit drug part. Um, plus also, I think it's probably going to be the larger market. Hmm. Um, the medicinal applications is rather large market right now, but I think we'll find that a lot of the medicinal users today will probably become recreational users in the future and not be classified as a medicinal patient. Yeah. Um, and and then, then there's people that are only patients and they don't want to use uh, marijuana in, in an illicit way. They don't want, or in a recreational way, they don't want to get high. They want to just get the medicinal effect, mm. which is why our first product, which is a, is a skin cream, um, 
it contains CBD, which is cannabidiol. <coughs> cannabidiol is uh, non-psychoactive. You could take a spoonful of it, you wouldn't notice much. Um, but it has a large be benefits medicinally. And uh, ours is on top of that is a topical application, so it's a cream. Uh, there is, uh, people always ask, first people ask, will this product make me high? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, it, it can't, and even it's a skin cream, it, even if it had THC, which is a psychoactive component, I think it has to be a very strong concentration before it'll have any effect. Um, but the other question is always I get, well, I work for, let's say, you know, a larger company that does drug testing because I, I operate heavy machinery. Uh, can I use this product? You, you can. Uh, it's not, first of all, it's not a concentration, and second, that, that would get detected. And second, it's a compound that they don't look for in a drug test because it's not actually something that is a drug. Yeah. So. It's a busy space. T trying to communicate with clarity the difference in the detail, medicinal, recreational, and then the breakdown within medicinal mm. of degrees of, of strength and use. Yeah, it's uh, it's a very busy field, very busy. Um, there's a lot of companies that are working on, let's say, similar uh, applications. Uh, again, we have a well, we have a specific technology that we've developed that I think catapults us to. As my colleague called it the, today, he said the tip of the spear. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to take so much work and so much research to figure out um, how this plant is is working. When you look at, um, let's say, uh, Percocets and Oxycontin, which are painkillers, you have one application here. Mm -hmm. It's a painkiller. So it's relatively easy to find out where we have the compound that, that does the pain killing. We, it's a one compound thing. Um, we can figure out what it does in the body to have this effect. Now you've got cannabis, which has been used as either as a, as a herb or as an extract, where you have, well, in the herb, I don't know how many hundreds of compounds. It's about three to 400 compounds in an extract. You don't know which one is the one that is working. And it turns out it's probably not just one. Hmm, it's probably a combination. It's called the entourage effect. Okay. The entourage effect is its known and it's accepted now that it exists. Nobody knows how it works. <laughs> and when you have these many, like, these many applications, so you're not only just looking at you know, localized pain. Well, now you're looking at, at what happens in the brain, what happens in the central nervous system, but then you also have an effect on diabetes. Well, that's probably somewhere completely else in the body where it works there. And that starts to get, you know, a rabbit hole to go down. Yeah. As a scientist, I love that because I can see so many people getting their master degrees, their PhDs on, on biochemistry and pharmacology mm. out of this kind of research. Uh, as a CEO of a drug company, I'm going like, oh my God, this is a... <laughs> <laughs> this is a nightmare. We have to find something that, that works well. Um, we, we are working together with a lot of different groups that are you're trying to figure out um, you know, certain targets. We're not going to go on everything that we could do. Hmm. Uh, for example, pain is something that is on the periphery of my, my view right now. It's not what I'm looking at. It's, it's a very, very big market. It's probably the biggest market uh, right now, but also the most crowded market. As you said, it's a very mm -hmm. busy space. Yeah. We're looking at more exotic uh, diseases. We have one trial uh, that we're starting in the Netherlands on Tourette syndrome, okay. uh, for example. So that's something that uh, I, I didn't even uh, know about the efficacy until about six or seven months ago that Tourette syndrome could be, could be uh, treated with cannabis. Uh, so it's something that um, is going to be very interesting to find out what works. Yeah. Listening to you, I almost want to go backwards instead of forwards. Yeah. <clears throat> Ancient cultures used cannabis um, mm -hmm. multiple ways without all the science. Yeah. And, and accepted it as applicable and, and promoted well-being. Like it was a good thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think that our, our de not dependence, but our intensity on science to verify, measure, make sure it's true, mm. has that gotten in the way of how we could be moving forward. 
cannabis has been around such a long time. Yeah. And I'm making a bit of a leap mm. that because of its long-term history and it's been integrated into civilizations for mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. But in North America or, or, you know, the past 300 years, it's taken a different turn. And, and we have to measure in, in science yeah. it. Um, are we going to come back full circle to find out that this, this plant has these huge benefits for human yeah. beings and we lost our relationship with it? Um, I think, yeah, to a, to a certain extent that is that, that is probably true. I've, I've, I've read a joke once where it says, you know, 10,000 years ago the shaman would have said, here, take this root, it's good for whatever you need. <laughs> yeah. Then, you know, a little bit later it was, no, 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 don't take this root, take this extract of this root, this is much better. And then later, relatively recently is no 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 don't don't take this root don't take the extract take this pill that we made from this extract from this root and we're starting to go back to no forget this pill just take the root yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <coughs> this kind of full circle uh, i see in in cannabis this is certainly something to talk about because we haven't done this with um we haven't done it with other drugs right now um, it is not accepted at all. Uh, and I, I think that is actually a shame because natural um, natural products that, for example, like cannabis or also like poppy flowers or many other uh, other things like calendula flowers, for example, are really good for, for skin issues. Um, we don't use that very much. You can get it, of course, in natural health food stores, but it's not accepted as a medicine. It's not accepted as a treatment. Um, because well, it's just a plant extract. Because we've gone away from this, uh, and we have a very medieval way of looking at at medicine. <laughs> I, I just came back from the Bioport conference in Halifax, where it was a fantastic uh, plenary speech uh, by uh, Dr. Peter Vaughan, I think was his name, um, about how our whole way of thinking of healthcare is very medieval and it's very hierarchical and it shouldn't be. Um, and I think the same way is true about about pharmaceuticals. We have this idea that. Well, if there's something in this plant, it must be that one compound. We got to find that one compound. And we can put it into a pill, and it's good. We've done this with THC. Mm -hmm. We've synthesized THC and put it into Marinol, Dronabinol. Well, it turns out the efficacy is very low, and it has very high side effects. Mm -hmm. THC by itself is a psychotic. It makes people it gives anxiety attacks or psychosis. Um, but when it's administered in the plant, together with all the other things that are in the plant, the psychosis effect isn't there. Hmm. But when it's pure, it is there. So it's kind of dangerous in sometimes to, to say, I found that one compound that I think does it, or not I think, that I know does it. <laughs> yeah, because you know? I can and prove it. Exactly. And, and then it turns out that uh, it may not be by itself. Um, you know, it's a little bit like... Um, Let's say you're starting a car, or you're, you're driving your car. You know that if you push the accelerator, you go faster. If you push the brake, you go slower. But if you don't turn the key beforehand, nothing is going to happen, right? So those are those are things that probably have like they happen in pharmacology as well. So you have these synergistic or entourage effects. Um, do we go back to this? Um, I think we have to strike a balance. I think we sh should not dismiss the um, yeah. more natural ways. We should also not dismiss the scientific way. <coughs> um, I think looking at, I think looking at, at the, the traditional sides of use and drawing conclusions from that and testing that with science, but in, in a smart way, I think that is the best way to do it, which is what we're trying to do. Uh, in our Tourette's uh, trial that we're starting, we're actually going to start with finding the strain of, of cannabis that works best as, as a plant. And then we're trying to replicate this into our formulations and standardize it down from there so we're actually looking at the we're not looking at one compound and giving this we're looking at which one is there already knowing and accepting that there is an entourage effect and then looking at replicating at least that yeah. um, side topic when mm -hmm. you were down in halifax at this convention mm -hmm. um did the topic of food and what we eat come up um because like plants are going back to the root yeah. Um, if we change some of our diet, a lot of health issues would change. Yeah. A lot of, uh, well, that is, I think this is now uh, 
it's a big topic right now. Uh, I haven't seen much at this conference right now, and I, I may have missed something um, on it because I was talking to a lot of different people. Yeah, well, well but, you were there um, for a different purpose. I was yeah. just curious in the food, range of... Well, food is something that interests me anyway. I, I did food uh, testing before in my life um, okay. uh, when I was working with the Research and Productivity, Productivity Council here in Fredericton, RPC. Um, and I'm, I'm very, you know, very conscious about the the toxins we're putting into food nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely not good to have our meat full with hormones, uh, which we don't know what it actually does in, the, in our bodies. Uh, we've tested everything it does in the cows, but we haven't tested what it actually <laughs> does in us. Um, you know, things like glyphosate. Uh, I'm actually, uh, personally, uh, I have an interest in that because um, I, I was thinking for a while I had a gluten intolerance. Uh, it turns out I don't because I can eat it in Europe, but I can't. I have a real problem here. And then I started reading scientific papers that are coming out now about glyphosate uh, probably being the culprit in the sharp rise of celiac disease, which is actually not celiac, it's actually a glyphosate My goodness. Uh, thing. So it's not really proven yet, but it, there are scientific papers that are certainly Cor under underpinning that. It. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, so food is, is definitely um, something we have to look for. And Actually, we can tie this again to, to, to cannabis because cannabis is a very good food source and protein source and mm -hmm. fat source. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we all know hemp seed oil is, is quite a he healthy um, oil to, to eat. Um, the hemp seeds themselves, we see them everywhere in the shops now, uh, hemp hearts as they're called. Um, uh, you know, you always hear this, oh, you could survive on just hemp. It's, well, it'd probably be a very boring existence on just <laughs> eating one. but. By the, the composition of it, it is relatively a whole food. It does put everything in there. And, and I think we can, you know, we don't see it much used in our, in our, um, in our food chain right now. It's all soy. Uh, you know, everything is soy, 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 or corn, corn yeah. starch, corn flour. And it's, it's all the same empty um, genetics that, that have been bred there, you know, the Roundup Ready corn. Yeah nutritionally isn't really that good at all. Yeah. Um, we could grow hemp and have far more nutrition and, and coming from that, you know. And we have malnourished children in this country mm -hmm. because, you know, there's, there's a poverty problem obviously and, and if you can't afford good food, well, you're going to get the cheap food and if the cheap food is, yep. Yep. you know, garbage for all intents and purposes, then that's what it's going to come out. How fascinating to sit and listen because within three steps you connected like a whole universe. You know? <laughs> and, but that's a fascinating thing. Yeah. It also makes me wonder if that's a path out of breaking down the stereotype about weed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my generation, yep. Cheech and Chong stuff that yep. still kind of perseveres. Mm -hmm. um, Snoop Dogg would be like a middle generation. I don't know who the current ones are. Yeah, that that you know are built into the culture, but it's so much more than what yeah. pop culture has done with one specific part of uh, a plant. So it, it, it very much is actually. It's funny that you that you mentioned Snoop Dogg and Cheech and Chong because uh, I saw a, I saw a TED talk of a gentleman who was um, promoting saying that people that use cannabis should be more open about the use of it because. He was actually a, a, a gay man growing up in, in the United States to a time when that was not something you wanted to advertise. Um, and for the longest time, the only people that, you know, were kind of connected with being gay were the drag queens and the, the flamers, as he calls, you know, the people that couldn't hide it or didn't want to hide it. Um, and, and for the longest time, what do we associate with the people that use weed? The, the Cheech and Chongs and the Snoop Dogs. Yeah. Um, but it's actually so much more. There's lawyers, there's politicians. Yep. <laughs> you know, it, it's not th th this image of the people that use cannabis are the lazy guys that don't do anything and sit on the couch and eat Cheetos. Um, that's that's not true. And you know, getting this out there would help to to have it a bit more broad. And then the use. You know, so, so do things. you have any th thoughts? I mean, you, we can all Google search and start to find out why that became the common mythology. Well, yeah, I, I would, I, I can tell you how it started, and I, the, the quotes I will say now are uh, probably very shocking to some people. Um, I sometimes start my pitch with this. Uh, Marijuana makes white people have sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. 
That was Harry Anslinger pitching the idea of illegalizing hemp to Congress. Uh, there was also sentences from the man saying, uh, it makes the darkies think they're as good as white people. It was a, a racist move. It was something to get a hold on saying, oh, well, marijuana is used mostly by the jazz groups in New Orleans and by the Mexicans coming up here, so let's illegalize this and have a way to, to round them all up and lock them up. And, uh, you know, and then it grew from, from there. Um, but this is, of course, the 20s, 30s, and beginning of the 40s, somewhere yeah. around that. This is also where the name marijuana really comes from because that was the name the Mexicans were using. It was a slang term like any other, we have weed or ganja or whatever yeah. you want to say, but that was the term the Mexicans were using. And uh, so Harry Enslinger says, we have to go and make this marijuana illegal. If he would have said, we have to make hemp illegal, people would have looked at him and said, are you mad? Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, because the hemp was something you made into ropes, you, you, you made into oil, you made into yeah. protein. But there was a spillover effect on hemp, though, once oh, mar marijuana became illegal. Because it was the whole thing. It was the plant. Um, people don't understand that hemp is cannabis. The botanical name for hemp is cannabis sativa. There are some hemp plants that produce THC. Huh. That is then called marijuana or cannabis. Legally, if you say cannabis, you're, you're talking about the illicit drug. But it's all hemp. Huh. It's all the same plant. Um, just some have profiles, uh, chemi chemical profiles that makes you high and some that don't. Yeah. And that's our only distinction. It's a pure legal distinction term. Yeah. Uh, the legal term actually, hemp is anything that has THC less than, I think, 0.03% THC. This might sound like a, a leap, but leaps are fun sometimes. Yeah, I like leaps. <clears throat> um, it sounds like um, that was all based on fear. Yeah, very much. It sounds like there's a window of making it all about love rather than about fear yeah well that would be a, it that would be a step that is definitely commendable i mean every time you can turn fear into love is something good mm. um and uh, you know looking at i mean uh, the 60s and 70s was the hippie movement was was largely connected with the use of marijuana as well um but I was but, so I was thinking of your three your three pieces. But that I, you I had. was just how do we build yeah, that culture? I was just and that culture is going to need a connector. So we have a just a little example of this. I um, at uh, at an, an event in Fredericton, I ran into a person who was working for a different cannabis company. Uh, they are not working medicinally. They're not working on the recreational part. They are working on the nutraceutical part, the nutritional part, uh, and and other hemp uses. They have currently, uh, this year, had their first proof of concept test batch grown in New Brunswick. I, I don't think it was harvested, it was just shown that it can be done. Um, and uh, last week, I got a phone call and I said, they said, oh, we're in Fredericton, do you want to come for lunch? Uh, and then after the lunch, they said, you know what, we're having a, a bit of a, a barbecue uh, with some of our shareholders coming down um, on next Saturday. Would you like, you and your wife like to come down? Yes, of course we're gonna gonna come down, and this is, you know, uh, this is nice to see because we work in the same industry. We are not direct competitors. Um, there certainly are some things that we could work on both of us, but the idea of saying, you know what, come down, let's let's have a chat, let's see how we can do this together, um, and that's something I really want for this province. Uh, unfortunately, I do see that the, you know there is, of course, everybody is looking out for themselves, and it is a gold rush right now. It is a real, and, and it's just, it's a panic right now. So nobody wants to show his cards. Uh, everybody wants to carve out their little piece, and uh, and that's fair enough, of course. That's that's what people want. But it, I think it would be a better piece and a bigger piece for everybody if we can all just say, you know what, I would like to do this and this. How can you help me? How can I help you? Yep. And uh, New Brunswick has, as you know, has the potential that is infinite. Yeah. Um, it has the willingness now. It is, the, you know, I think it's the only province in Canada that has highlighted cannabis as a priority for the government. We have uh, people at OMB that have, you know, special projects, cannabis. Mm. And um, we need to find a way, I think we need to find a nexus point where we have somebody who is on the outside of the whole thing, who's not in the industry and not on the government side, but kind of, let's say, uh, an NGO or something, a non-profit, I mean, something like BioNB that we have for the biotech industry. 
by when we could fulfill this role um, that is a nexus point for everybody and you can go like I'm doing this how can I fit in and then they say you know what I couldn't connect you with a B and C yep. and you should talk to those people and this way this is how the industry is built and and I hope that it's gonna happen this way mm, some of what you say reminds me of conversations about the, the craft brewing industry because yeah. they found ways to share resources, still compete, yep. but they've built a culture, and it's been quite successful for a small. Mm, New Brunswick's a small place, and, and they're quite successful at what they're doing. It's it's very funny because uh, I think it was two days ago. My wife said, "You know, you should go and talk to Sean Dunbar from Picaroons because the craft brewing industry did exactly what you guys are trying to do." She said, "And this is exactly what we want. We want a friendly competition, but we want it. We want it New Brunswick focused." Yeah. You know, but focus, focus the industry to the outside. But we want a New Brunswick industry here to become a stronghold. I think New Brunswick has the potential and the willingness to become the research and cannabis industry center of North America. Hmm. We have that chance. Hmm. Are we going to capitalize on it? I hope so. <laughs> hope so too. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, to you a little bit, how did you yeah. land in Fredericton? Um, how did I land in Fredericton? I did my PhD in, in Ireland uh, through University College Dublin. I was working at the Marine Institute. Uh, the Marine Institute, I was working on shellfish toxins. And there's a big shellfish toxin research center here close. It's in Halifax at NRC. Uh, so I spent about eight months there during my PhD in 2006. I finished in 2008. 2008, as you wait, remember. Wait, I want to catch this. So you started your PhD in 2006? No, no, no. no I started my PhD in 2003, mid end of 2003. Mm, done in 2008. And in 2006, I was uh, here in Halifax to do some work. Yeah. The reason was our lab was moving, huh. and there was a big interruption of, of, of everything. So they sent us over here. They basically gave us on loan to NRC. Uh, and some material, and they had the expertise and instrumentation we could use, and we actually brought out, you know, uh, some reference materials for for the shellfish yeah. toxin. Well, I was going to tease you. You might be the only PhD person that I've met that got it done in that uh, short period no. of time. I think my colleague who now works at NRC got it done quicker than I did. Uh, no, I, I took I took a while, and I think it took me a year from finishing in the lab to actually having my degree. Uh, you know, between writing up the the thesis and um, and getting the exam and everything. But I finished in 2008. And 2008, as you recall, was the, the year of the uh, cataclysmic breakdown of the world's economy. Uh, and Ireland was certainly, I think it was probably one of the hardest hit places in the world. It was probably hit harder than the United States even. Yep. Um, and uh, now we saw this coming. Because uh, I've, I've been living there since 2003. And when you see that only halfway through my PhD, I heard that Ireland had borrowed more money than than earned overall, and you know everybody was getting a hundred percent mortgages for their second house. This is, does not go well, and uh, of course it it collapsed, and we we had just left, and we had orientated ourselves towards Canada because I had the relationship that I had with NRC, and uh, but during the time I was here, I actually met people from New Brunswick. And I liked New Brunswick. I really liked it. And I said, I'm going to try to come here. And I ended up getting a job with RPC. And that's how I, how I ended up in, in New Brunswick. Um, I've been here now. <coughs> Actually, it's been, um, today is the 20th. Uh, it's been exactly nine years and a week. <laughs> <laughs> I think I started on the 15th of October at RPC in 2008. And um, yeah, five years at RPC. Yeah. And haven't looked back since. It's been it's That's been great. going uh, crazy. And now I'm full circle back. I'm hoping to be doing a lot of work with RPC because mm -hmm. they're a fantastic resource that we have here in in, in the province and directly here in Fredericton. So as New Brunswick moves forward with um, how to create a culture for this, do you have some key points or pointers about what you think we should be doing first, second, third, or yeah. to develop? Because politics being politics, and which would be lovely for that culture to change. Yeah. Um, if there's going to be some people who have advantage and some who don't, maybe because of access or maybe because of lack of access. There's a challenge with shared vision, because you've talked about it within your circles. But if the province is going to create a new economy, 
and move forward. Yeah. It needs to know how to grab hold of a mo- moment. Mm-hmm. And and you sound like you're in the middle of a moment. Yeah, uh, we're cert- th- yeah, I can say we're certainly in the middle of a moment. Um the government is luckily very interested and very involved. Um there are some things that uh you know, I, I think they are a little bit with blinkers because it's just the ways things are sometimes done or normally done. Um, you know, the recreational is taking, I think, a little bit too much of attention. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, you know, I find it when I talk to, to people from ONB and, and the government and, and other uh, stakeholders there, I always remind people, I said, yes, there's recreational and I, it's great and it's going to be a big market, but we must not forget that there is a medicinal and a research side to it. We have two research chairs now in Fredericton uh, at Stu and at UNB, I think. Okay. Um, one is for social impact of recreational cannabis and the other one is for the pharmaceutical application. Uh, so that is fantastic to see. Um, the- I don't know who that's going to be yet because I don't think they have really, a, they have announced that they have the chair, but... And yeah. this is this is the kind of thing I I, I have the feeling and, and I know how this works in universities. Then there's always this kind of battle: who's going to get this? And then there's the prestige thing. I think we have to be careful that we leave that behind us. That is toxic for for this to destroy this moment that you've talked about. So you're speaking to an interesting point because we need a new way of doing things, not just new outcomes, right? But how we put it together, or otherwise we'll trip on ourselves. Yeah. And we'll do it the way we've always done it, and then wonder why the moment and, passed. This and and here is one of the things I think is the biggest danger, and this is the biggest thing that that has been an annoying me a little bit, and that is the secrecy. Yeah. The secrecy that I that I get from, you know, government a lot. You talk to somebody and you say, "Have you heard about this company?" No, no, don't really know them. Can't really say much. And then you figure out, but you're funding them with four hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> and that's your department, <laughs> and you're the boss. Don't tell me that you don't know about them. Yeah. You can say, "Well, they're a client of ours, but I can't talk to you about them." I totally respect this. That's fine. But it's the it's this kind of trying to, oh, well, we're not going to show our cards. And, and, and I'm pretty sure the government has a plan on what they want to do. Um, I think the biggest thing I would advise the government to do not to miss this moment is broadcast and publicize what you want to do. Tell everybody what your plan is. Don't try to move people into the direction of the plan you want to do without telling anybody. Because what ends up happening is First of all, it doesn't, you know, I, I don't give a lot of trust to somebody when I can get the feeling you're not telling me everything. Yep. Uh, and I certainly don't give a lot of trust to people when I know they're not telling me everything, but they're trying to point me into a direction that they want me to go in. Yeah. Well, my normal, because, you know, that's just me, my normal <laughs> response is then not to go that direction. <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it, you know, we need to communicate. This is why I said earlier, we need to have an access point. We need to communicate out. We need to have a common communal vision we need to get everybody together and say this is what we want to do can somebody fill in some of these blanks we have a puzzle it's like having a puzzle piece here and we've got the box lid with the picture and we know what it's going to be and now we're looking for the pieces but what i feel sometimes is they say well we have this puzzle we want you to put together we're not going to show you what the picture looks like you know, yeah. and that's just that's just not good. Yeah. We need to know what's going on, and we need to all pull together and say, "I would like this," and somebody says, "That'll be great because I can do this." So, and and we're doing this in the industry, yeah. but I have a big problem to get sometimes get this correlated to the government. And when I talk to the government, it seems to go other way, and they're not talking to industry. And this is something we really have to change in this province: is the communication. Not only in this province, I've I've seen this as a big problem in in companies. When I was a consultant, all around the world, communication is very very important. And we are tending to be very secretive about things because, you know, some things you just don't want to broadcast very big, but. Overly secretive is, is very destructive, and it's going to lose this moment. Great. So one of the past guests on the show is David Alston, mm-hmm. entrepreneur in residence for the current government. He spoke with much enthusiasm how the government has no research and development department for breaking in new ideas and new ways of doing things. And he got very animated about we need to create this parallel over here of NGOs and a synthesis mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. all these conversations so that the government who's mandate most of the time is to react as opposed to create 
Yeah. So, so how do we break forward, or how do we yeah. break an old paradigm, create a new paradigm? You're speaking directly to one example of what that could be. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. I think he's, he's, he's got a point um, because I always, you know, people always say, "Oh, the government has to create more jobs." And as you said, the government doesn't create jobs. The only thing the government can do is create the environment hmm. for private industry to create the jobs. Uh, sometimes, as a private industry stakeholder um, I see that some of my colleagues they always want the government to pay for everything and it you know the private industry we have to drive this government doesn't create the jobs unless you want more government jobs <laughs> mm -hmm. well one of those but, themes might come up in the next election because we'll walk into one next year yeah yeah oh, can you imagine industry paying for itself uh, instead of asking government for money all the time I think industry in the end if it's working well, industry is perfectly capable of paying for itself. Um, it's companies like myself. We are currently, I, I call it, we're walking the valley of death at the current moment in time. We, we had an initial small investment. We're looking for, for the next, the actual seed investment, as it's called, the actual yep. big investment. Uh, just to give you like around a couple, couple of tens of thousands was our first one. Now we're yep. looking for several hundred thousand yep. uh, and then the next one will be into the several millions but this first step is where companies need help once you become a company that has revenues of five six or seven million you don't need much government help yep. you need a, you could you could do things like I want to expand I want to you know uh, I need to go and do a bit of a business development drive maybe the government can help you connect you to people there's these, these trade missions and so on that's fine yeah. but if a company is profitable and that doesn't happen in from especially not in the biotech industry it doesn't happen in the first couple of years but once it's profitable uh, I think the government subsidy should start to decline uh, and then once they get large, we have examples of large, large companies and corporations in this in this province that are probably still getting a lot of government subsidies. And whether it's a subsidy as in money given or whether it is a subsidy as in you don't have to pay as much for your property tax or for something, that's still a subsidy yep. in the end of the day. Um, but that shouldn't really be done. I'm probably going to look back at this interview in about 10 years and say, you idiot. But no, <laughs> no. It, it is something that, that needs to get You're speaking taken. to a culture shift. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Well, and, 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 it's, need it. and, it, and it needs to apply to the new way of doing business. And that's a shift from an old industrial-based model yeah. to a new kind of adaptive, cultural-based model almost. Yeah, and it's, it, basically, it's the end of the day, it's greed. Um, the question is when, you know, of course, you can always, you always want more, uh, you want a company to grow more, and if I get more money from from anybody, f you know, free money, yeah. that can help me grow more. But it's also taken a drain on on the community, yeah. and I think we've seen very firsthand what happens when you drain a community. Um, this is why we're in this in this situation that we're in. Yep. Cannabis could be one piece of the puzzle. I would not like to say that this one industry is going to be the messiah no. for this province, no. but we can be a good part. From several other guests, we're slowly getting pieces of another puzzle mm -hmm. put together about things New Brunswick could be doing to move forward for the next 50 years. And this is definitely so one many. of those pieces. It also ties a touch to farming. Will there be a huge farming element to this uh, as you progress your there, side of it? There will be. Um, as I said, uh, you look at the you know, first of all, the nutraceutical side, where, where you get hemp seeds and, and hemp oil and, and fiber grown, that's all large-scale farming. Um, but even for myself, uh, we use uh, cannabidiol, which is from hemp, which comes from industrial hemp farms. And we use, you know, we buy it by the kilogram. And you need, uh, I'd say, about an acre or, or so to make that kilogram. So, you know, this is what we're using now. If we're really scaling up, <coughs> we need tens of kilograms probably every month, and that's, you know, tens of acres just for one application. And um, the nice thing with hemp is it's a multi-use crop. So you could say, I'm going to harvest the CBD mm. for, for the pharmaceutical side, and afterwards we have all the... the the rest left, but well, we can make that into paper or into fiber. Um, I mean, we have a big paper producer in the province. I think they should look at at large scale farming of, of hemp mm -hmm. um, as an as an alternative or a, 
or a side by side to our forest. Um, yeah. so, because that's what you mean about a culture, a culture shift. Yes, right? it's a total culture shift in in the way that we are having to look. A li- what we have to do is we have to think smartly. Hmm. Uh, we don't have to think with blinkers on. And 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 what I really want people to encourage is every time you see somebody or hear somebody say or you find yourself saying we've always done it this way why should we change this <laughs> step back and say well there's probably a better way of doing it um this is the innovative spirit and this is where i think people when they talk about innovation you hear this word very inflatiously used innovation everything is innovative well the next candy crush is not innovation that's just using a technology and bringing out another blockbuster takeover or acquisition from a company Uh, it's great to make money maybe but it's not innovative innovations are things that that, that are a new thing or a new method of doing something it doesn't have to be necessarily something new you can still make paper we still make paper well let's make it with something that is more renewable more sustainable and less degradational to to the environment I'm not saying this could be hemp, but this could be hemp, but, yep. it, you know, think about what else could we use? Yep. What else can we do? Um, cars, we're not going to do away with cars, but maybe we can make them more efficient or go to electric. You know, this, this, those are innovations. Yep. Um, and I think that's what I see in this province a lot. They seem to equate technology. Anything that has technology is innovation. And that's just simply not true because there's old technologies that have to be innovated, hmm. um, but just bringing out an old technology, making a new company with an old technology, that's not innovation. Yeah. Excellent points. Um, we need to shift the culture. We need to build a te- team almost, so everybody recognizes yeah. their role on the team. Yep. Um, analogies I like to use is uh, there's only one ball, and there's five of you on the team, so figure out how to share the ball. Yeah. But if you're really good at passing the ball and you're really good at shooting the ball, then we'll figure out how to let you do what you do well. Yeah. And you, but then the team has movement and success. Yeah, yeah you, have a, you have a striker and you have a goalie, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Those and sorts of elements. And somehow we stumble at that developmental phase socially. And yeah. then there's all the technical development that you're doing. So to steer more specific towards, towards your workplace... Mm-hmm. So what is it that you need in the near future to get you through the next three to five years? Well, we're, we're trying to look for, we're looking for investment right now, which is for equity investment. So we're not, well, I mean, once we have the investment, we're trying to, of course, get the maximum out of this to leverage this for research projects and innovative projects. NRC is a good partner on that. Um, uh, ACOA is a great partner. And I was talking to ACOA, they have these, for example, the Atlantic Initiative Fund, AIF, and they always say, well, we're a little bit like an in equity investment without taking equity. But people always wonder, well, why would you do it then? Why would you give money? They get repaid. It's, I think it's interest-free, I think. Um, so why would, you, why would you do that? Well, because we get economic development. And yeah. that's what we want. You're bridging time. And it, and it exactly is bridging time. And this company that got this money from us, they now have a product. This product will bring back more money in corporate tax from the company paid, more money in in tax base from because they can employ more people this is how the government gets repaid but it had we have to be careful to say as i said earlier when the company is already big and it's already profitable um, and giving it another million or two million dollars and they may make one more job yeah. that's not the, the return on investment there is bad, but you give the $1 million to a young company, the new one that's coming up, well, they're going to create 10 jobs with that, and they're going to go to 100 jobs from there. So that, that we, have to, <coughs> we have to play as a team, everybody. Government is one team player, private industry is another, and I think mm-hmm. NGOs can be another. Yep. And then there's the public, not to forget the public, because in the end, there are customers, there are people that uh, not, not only buy our products, but also they work and make our products. It's, yep. it's the people that we hire in. Um, hopefully, we'll hire quite a few people soon. Uh, but this has to go with the investment that yep. we're looking for right now. Do you have any access to angel investors in this province? Um, that was a big topic at the 2010 Economic yeah. Summit that we had. Yeah. And so you've got the who's who of the business community in New Brunswick at the Beausage yeah. Motel in Moncton for two yeah. days. And the number one thing they kept talking about was getting themselves to invest in their own yeah. province. 
Um, um, seven years later now, we've never heard many stories of that actually happening. I was talking to um, uh, Ross Finlay and Brian Lowe for the two individuals that have started the First Angel Network uh, at the conference uh, yesterday. And um, not only that I talked to them, but they had a very good panel discussion with the uh, two other uh, angel investors. And the question was, why do you angel invest? Why do you do this? Why do you invest money when you know that the failure rate of the companies is at 70%? Yeah. Um, you know, you have a 30% chance of seeing your money again or maybe making a bit of money, but 70% of never seeing it again. Uh, and quite a few angels that I meet, and there are quite a few in this province, that, but or in, in, in at least in the Maritimes, um, that that say they do it because they like what they do, they like the ideas behind it, and they like the idea that maybe they can help bring something else out and help other people. That's often a, a point that I hear from angels. I think we have way more people in this province that could become angels, that should look into that, um, because there's a lot of people in this province that, that have you know, a, a good bank account situation, that have maybe uh, you know, exited companies or, or made their money somehow. And instead of just going and, you know, they don't want to do another. Uh, doing a startup, you burn out. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not an easy job. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't want to go through this more than two or three times. I've seen some, some people that do it two or three times, but mostly then they take a, an angel position. And I think a lot of people here should be looking into that. You know, contact, I think in this case, contact First Angel Network. This is exactly what they're trying to do, trying to build a network in the Maritimes of angel investors. Um, at this stage where we are at, angel investment is certainly still something we look at. The next round will be a bigger venture capital fund then, which is also something we, we have to kind of attract a little bit more uh, visibility to the province. But that comes when you build an industry. Yeah. You know, when the industry is successful, the investment is going to come because they know it's a risk calculation. They say, oh, the industry is good over there. A lot of companies are successful. That Chances are that this company that is a new one coming up will also be successful. And, and that will attract more money into this province instead of funneling money out. Um, and that, you know, from there we'll, we'll have a cascade and, and, and hopefully have a knock-on effect to other industries. Yeah. Excellent. How, um, how would you like to end our conversation? How would I like to end it? Well, I would just, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to get anybody who watches this to, you know, keep an eye on what's, what's happening in the province. Um, also keep an eye on, or, or a thought about what can everybody do? Where can we link in? Um, if you, you know, if you see somebody that has a new company, such as ourselves, or it, there's quite a few startups here, the biggest thing people can do that doesn't take anything at all is to follow the social media and to when a tweet comes out and they like a tweet like it and retweet it we've done this in um, you know like your Facebook pages and so on but we've done this in Ireland at the accelerator where there was 15 companies and I still do this today and all the other companies do it if I tweet something every single one of them will retweet it it goes around the world really quickly and this is how we can get New Brunswick out there um, you know, when I tweet something important, I make sure to tag my director from, from Ireland, from the Accelerator on there. He will retweet it. He has 62,000 followers. So immediately, with one person, just go and click, click. It goes to 62,000 people. But everybody here, if I had 100 people that retweet my tweet, that would give so much profile to our company and therefore New Brunswick. Same as for companies like... Soma Detect, which is a big one right now, uh, Fera, who just won the Bio Innovation Challenge, um, Zekin Labs. We have so many good, so many good startup companies coming out of here. Their profile needs to be. They need to be known. Once they're known, it helps them to raise more money. It helps them to get more products out, and it helps everybody to be more successful. That's great. <laughs> Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.